So it is now my true pleasure to introduce tonight's presenter, Dr. Doug Tallamy. Um, he is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored more than 106 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 41 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of our animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published in 2007. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, was published in 2014. And Nature's Best Hope, which was a New York Times bestseller, was released in February of 2020. We are delighted for this evening's talk, which focuses on his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, released in March of 2021. Uh, last, in 2021, uh, he co-founded Homegrown National Park with Michelle Alfandari. His awards include recognition from the Garden Writers Association, Audubon, the National Wildlife Federation, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticultural Society. Mm -hmm. If we could clap, I would invite everyone to welcome you with a round of applause, but I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, I do want to talk to you today about um, what I call the nature of oaks. I'm really talking about the species that rely on oaks, and it's a lot of species. But before we do that, let me remind you what E.O. Wilson told us way back in 1987. He said, insects are the little things that run the world, and wrote an entire paper telling us exactly why he made that statement. But it's true. They run the world, and the problem is we're losing our insects. The planet has already lost at least 45% of its insects. Uh, and it's doing that because of our actions. Lights kill insects. Neonicotinoids kill insects. And the green areas are where we have a lot of neonicotinoid use. Deforestation kills insects. Cars kill insects. Climate change kills insects. When you take an area like this and you turn it into that, it kills insects. What does that have to do with oaks? Well, it turns out there is no better way to address this loss of insects, to start to share our spaces with insects, than to plant an oak. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Starting with uh, the oaks that we planted at our house, Cindy, my, my wife Cindy and I moved into this house in the year 2000. It was a piece of a farm that had been uh, cut up into 10 acre lots uh, and had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So there weren't any, any trees there. Uh, well, what was there were a lot of non-native plants. This is what most of the property looked like. Uh, and just to encourage you, this is Cindy getting rid of all of that stuff. 10 acres worth of invasive multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and, and on and on and on. And many of us have these problems on our property. So please don't give up. You can get rid of it. And when you do, you can plant an oak. And that's what we did. There was an oak uh, down the street about a mile and a half that first year that dropped a number of acorns. It was a white oak. So I gathered up a bunch of them and I planted them around the property. We're gonna follow what happens to this particular oak. White oaks germinate in the fall. They put down a, a single root, a radical, and that's all they do in the fall. But in the spring, they put up their first set of leaves. As a matter of fact, they put up their only set of leaves that year. Uh, and it, so it looks like oaks are growing really, really slowly and people get discouraged uh, and they have that impression that oaks are slow growers. In fact, that oak is growing as fast as anything else, but most of the growth is underground. The first year, they're putting on 10 times more root biomass than above ground leaf biomass. Uh, and those oaks, those roots will then support much more rapid growth a few years down the road uh, and produce a very healthy tree. So this is the tree we're going to follow here. This is in its second year. Um, it's got a little deer cage around it. So if you're planting oaks uh, in anywhere, pretty much anywhere, but certainly in, in, in Connecticut, you have to protect them from deer or you won't have any oaks. That's what the tree looked like 18 years later. It's 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree and it didn't take that long. And one of the points I want to make tonight is that oaks are a lifeline to an awful lot of creatures. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks, uh, a number of mammals, including rodents, but even the big ones, bears, many bears overwinter in the large hollow spaces of, of uh, the giant oaks that are in our forests, raccoons, possums, 
There are not that many reptiles that depend on oaks, but there are several species of butterflies that specialize on them. Hundreds of species of moths depend on oaks, as well as the predators and parasitoids that use those moths. Then we have cynipid gall wasps that are making the galls on our oaks. On our oaks. We have a number of beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, a number of weevils. And then underneath the oaks, we have another whole community of organisms, many spiders, dozens more species of arthropods and mollusks and annelids that depend on oak leaf litter. So it's a very complex and diverse community of life associated with the oaks in our yards. The problem is that community goes unnoticed. And if it goes unnoticed, it is unappreciated. And that's why I wrote uh, the book, The Nature of Oaks. It is a month by month guide to the life that is on your oaks. Uh, and my goal was to provide the knowledge that may generate interest in your oaks. And interest often leads to compassion. And I think we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world these days. First, uh, before we start, we'll talk about a few facts. The genus Quercus contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. There are 200 species of oaks in Mexico alone. So it's a large genus uh, in terms of, of uh, trees. Most tree gene genera are not that big. Uh, the word comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez meaning tree. So oaks truly are fine trees. There are four major taxonomic sections in North America. The white oak group is called the Quercus group. The red oak group is Lobati. Barentes is the live oak group in the south and a much smaller canyon oak group, Protobalanus in the west. This is the distribution of oaks in the US. There is at least one species of oak in every area except the brown. Uh, so in the high dry plains and the, the coniferous mountains, the oaks drop out. But uh, the center of distribution in US is the Southeast where we have lots of species of oaks, but there are 38 species of oaks in California as well. Another surprise to a lot of people is that oaks live a lot longer than we give them credit for. 900 year average life cycle, 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods, they're delivering unique ecological services to the landscape around them. We'll talk about why oaks generally don't live that long. It's because of something that we've done to them. What is the oldest oak in the country? Well, people argue about it, but it could be the Penchenka oak, a coastal live oak in California. It's estimated to be around 2000 years old. But if you really want the oldest oak, you have to go to the small ground cover oaks, like the Palmer oak, also in California. They root in one place and then they grow slowly and then root in another place and this area dies and then they just keep going without ever really dying. This specimen has been estimated to be 13,000 years old. So it's one of the oldest specimens, oldest living thing on the planet. They can be big. This was the biggest white, white oak in North America in Y, Maryland. So it was called the Y oak. Uh, I did get to see it before it fell over in a hurricane. Gee, it must be 20 years ago at this point, but it was, it was enormous. Uh, but another thing I wanna stress today is that there are small oaks that we can use in small properties. So don't let the, the large size of some of our species scare you away. And then finally, oaks have superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they are supporting more species than other trees. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide. In other words, pulling it out of harm's way, out of the, the atmosphere and building their tissues out of that carbon. And then pumping the extra carbon into the soil through their root systems. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have put there over the eons. And oaks do that better than most other trees. They're the best soil stabilizers because of those big root systems. They make the best leaf litter because it lasts longer than any other leaf litter. A single oak leaf can take up to three years to break down. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. Now, I started the book in October, and people want to know why. Why October? Well, that was the month that my, my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about oaks. And it was October. And I looked out the window, and there was the oak. And October, of course, is... Um, so the end of September, beginning of October is when those acorns are, are falling and hitting the ground. We notice acorns at that, that point. And a single oak in its lifetime can make a lot of acorns, up to 3 million acorns uh, before it dies. And each one of them is a very valuable piece of food for a number of creatures. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. So lots of, of mammals, particularly rodents, depend on acorns, but so do the big guys. Again, uh, black bears are eating as many 
acorns in the fall as possible because they want to put on fat to help them get through that winter. And then, of course, our squirrels and our cute deer are also eating a lot of acorns. Turkeys depend on acorns for the same reason. They've got to make it through the winter, and they're scouring the, the woods in the uh, fall to eat as many acorns as they can. But a number of birds depend on acorns. red belly woodpeckers and tip mice and towhees and uh, nuthatches, flickers, they're all eating acorns. And many of our ducks as, as well, particularly wood ducks. They really love acorns. So any acorn that falls into the water, if it's viable, it will sink and the ducks dive down and, and get them, or they'll come right out on the, on the shore and eat as many acorns as they can. There are a number of invertebrates that depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil larva. It has finished developing inside the acorn. It's crawling out of the acorn now to become this guy. And they can be very common in our acorns. Then there's a, a group of moths called acorn moths. They all look like this. <clears throat> you need DNA to separate the different species, but it's several species where the caterpillar develops in an acorn and then emerges as a moth. So you have all these things eating acorns. And if you go under an oak tree, maybe a week, two weeks after they drop their acorns, it's utter destruction. Uh, there aren't any viable acorns. They've all been carried away or eaten or crushed. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. And this is where a very ancient mutualism comes to the rescue. It's the relationship between jays and oaks. Both lineages evolved in what is now the Arctic 56 million years ago, and right away they hit it off together. The, the uh, jays got food in the form of those acorns, it helps them get through the winter. What do jays do for oaks? They allow oaks to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. So how does this, this work? Well, jays, of course, are storing those acorns for winter use. They don't cache them. They bury them singly. So they're not making big piles of acorns, uh, but they're, they're barely burying them singly. They will pick up an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And that's the key. That's farther than other acorn dispersers actually move acorns around. And then they'll find a loose area on the ground and tap the acorn beneath the soil surface. Now, if they think that another jay has watched them do that, they'll wait around for a few minutes and dig up their acorn and move it to another place because jays know that jays steal acorns. And then of course, when during the winter, <clears throat> when there's nothing else to eat, they'll go back and find those acorns and survive. Well, they're very busy uh, in the fall, particularly right now. Um, a single jay can bury 4,500 acorns each fall, but they only remember where one out of every four acorns is which means a single jay is actually planting thousands of oak trees, 3,360 oak trees each year. And if they do it a mile from the parent tree, that's what allowed those oak trees to disperse faster than other tree genera. It's not just blue jays that are doing that. All We've got seven or eight species of jays in this country. They all have a relationship with acorns. This is a scrub jay in Oregon doing exactly the same thing. Now, jays are not the only birds that have very close relationship with uh, acorns. This is the acorn woodpecker in the Southwest, very beautiful bird. Uh, and it's doing pretty much the same thing as our jays, uh, but they do it in a different way. They are storing acorns for winter use, but they don't store them underground. What they do is they carve holes, little acorn holders in a dead snag in a tree that is already dead. And then they stick the acorn in there. Uh, and that's where the acorn will spend most of the winter until the, the uh, woodpecker is hungry and it'll get it out and, and eat it. But they can make a lot of acorn holders in a tree, up to 50,000. And it's a very valuable, that makes that tree a very valuable resource. That takes a lot of work. So acorn woodpecker families, uh, they're a social group. They stay together and they guard their acorn trees very jealously from any other acorn woodpecker. So if you have uh, an acorn tree in your yard, it's enormously entertaining. They will uh, interact with that tree over and over and over again, year after year. November is when you might look back and say, well, there were a lot of acorns this year, or there weren't very many at all. Uh, and that's another curious aspect about oaks. They don't reproduce uh, evenly each year. It's kind of an all or nothing uh, mode of e reproduction. And when it's all, when they make a lot of acorns, it's called a mast year. In other years, they make very few or none. Curious reproductive behavior, so ecologists, uh, of course, want to explain it. There are four leading hypotheses about why oaks mast. Predator satiation, predator reduction, 
improved pollination and energy partitioning. And each one of those uh, could be operating at the same time. So these are not mutually exclusive hypotheses. Predator satiation. This is an acorn weevil outside of an acorn. They can be really common. Up to 90% of the acorns on a tree can have acorn weevils in them. Uh, and that's true for acorn moths. Uh, and of course, the populations of squirrels and deer can build up around all of those acorns. If oaks made the same number of acorns every single year, all of those acorn eaters would stabilize their population around that number, and they'd eat just about every single acorn. But if oaks vary the number of, of acorns, so if they make a lot one year, they'll produce an awful lot of acorn weevils, an awful lot of squirrels, and so on, but then the next year they make almost none then there's predator reduction. You have mass starvation uh, and the populations of the things that eat acorns really is reduced. Then the oak will typically go two or three or four years without making very many acorns and then another mass year. And then the population of squirrels and acorn weevils and acorn moths is much smaller than, uh, it's too small to be able to take out all the acorns that are produced. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. These are the male catkins that release uh, pollen on the wind. These are the oak uh, female flowers up here. They're very inconspicuous, uh, but they don't mature at the same time the pollen is released on a given tree. So a tree cannot pollinate itself. It depends on pollen floating around from another tree. And if all the trees are releasing their pollen in pretty much the same time, and they release a whole bunch of it, it increases the chances of successful pollination because wind pollination really is a game of chance. And then finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, they can. This is a scarlet oak in my front yard. There's never enough energy to go around. So oaks uh, allocate it towards reproduction. They make a lot of acorns or they allocate it towards growth and, and grow a fair amount, but make very few acorns. Rarely do they do both at the same time. So again, those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive and you put them all together and you probably have a good idea of why oaks mast. Okay, December is when you might recognize another curious behavior of oaks and that is that they don't drop their leaves even though it's a deciduous tree. And this is very true with the uh, white oak group uh, and it's very true with younger white oak trees. It's a condition called marcescence where they hang on to their leaves all winter long. Uh, again, curious behavior. So why is that? Uh, well, uh, the leaning hypothesis is that it wasn't that long ago, 9, 10, 11,000 years ago, that uh, the world was full of large Pleistocene mammals. This is the group of large mammals that was in Mexico alone. Three species of mammoths, the giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet, camels, horses, rhinoceros. There were something like 44 species of rhinoceros in, in the world uh, back then. And many of these creatures were what we call browsers, like the white-tailed deer today. Um, the deer is not out eating grass in your, your front lawn. It's eating woody material, particularly over the winter time, particularly the buds, uh, the meristematic tissue of next year's growth. So if oaks surround the buds of next year's growth with the dead leaves of the previous year, it makes that a very untasty mouthful. You can't get to the bud without getting a mouthful of dead leaves and it protects them. And the distribution of marcescent leaves supports that hypothesis because they only go up about 18 feet. Above that, none of those mammals could reach. Uh, and so the, the oak tree does not need to hang on to their, their leaves. It's pretty hard to test that hypothesis these days, but it does make a nice story. And marcescence gives uh, oaks a landscape trait that other deciduous trees don't have. And that is that they are, uh, they can be used as a screen. So if you don't like your neighbors, you actually can use a white oak to screen out your neighbor, both in the wintertime and the summertime. January, <clears throat> this is of course cold time of the year. Most people are not out staring up in their oaks, but if you do, you might notice a bunch of tiny birds jumping from branch to branch. Now they're not playing. Uh, energy is, is always in short supply. So uh, the birds don't wanna waste it. And I'm talking about birds like chickadees and titmice and, and um, yellow crown kinglets, golden crown kinglets. Um, they're hopping around those, those trees. Now, chickadees and, and titmice are the birds that are feeders. They're eating seeds, but only 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. Uh, the other 50% is insects and spiders. So maybe they're looking for insects and spiders up there in our oak trees, 
But of course, we all know there's no insects up there in the wintertime. The golden crown kinglet doesn't eat seeds at all. It is entirely insectivorous. It should have migrated but it doesn't, it stays up in the north. And that is the kinglet paradox. What is a bird that requires insects staying in the north where there aren't any insects to eat? Well, Bern Heinrich, uh, who a uh, wonderful naturalist, he's retired at this point, but he still writes a column for Natural History Magazine. He doesn't like paradoxes. So he looked inside the crops of golden crown kinglets in Maine in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars. There are caterpillars up in those trees. Many of them, most of them, all of them look like sticks. And that's why we didn't know they were there. We just didn't see them. Uh, when it gets cold, they have antifreeze proteins in their cells that keep those cells from bursting. So they shrink a little bit. And then when it gets warmer, they swell a little bit, but they just sit there. There's, there is nothing to, for them to eat. So they sit there all winter long. So we don't have a, a, a kinglet paradox anymore. The kinglets and the chickadees and chipmice and the other birds are there to eat the caterpillars that are in our oaks over the winter time. The next question though is, what are the caterpillars doing in the oaks in the winter time? Um, these are nearly full-grown caterpillars. Now, most insects overwinter as eggs, uh, or they overwinter as chrysalids or, or pupae. A few overwinter as adults, but very few overwinter as caterpillars, as, as larvae. So we need to explain that. Um, again, we're, we're guessing, but uh, it could be that in the spring, of course, those buds break and we have brand new foliage. If you overwinter as a large caterpillar, you have first dibs on this. You can outcompete any, any tiny little caterpillar that just hatched out of an egg. If you overwinter as an adult, you've got to find a mate and, and uh, then lay those eggs. And that even delays things more. If you overwinter as a chrysalis or a pupa, you've got to emerge and then find a mate. So the, the caterpillars that spend the winter ready to go uh, essentially have an endless food supply in the spring. February is the quietest time of year for oaks. So let's talk about what I call oak landscaping myths. Now, you know, myths often have some degree of fact associated with them, or at least they used to. And these, I hear these all the time. Uh, oaks are too expensive to use. They grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. I hear people say, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Uh, they're too big to use on small lots. If we do use them, they're gonna fall over and crush our house. Um, they will lift up our sidewalks and our hard, hardscape. Fact or fiction, let's look at each one of those. Uh, well, are oaks too expensive? They can be, if you insist on instant gratification. In other words, if you insist on planting a large tree and nurserymen have figured out that you are willing to pay $3,000 for a large tree uh, and, and uh, have it moved, they're getting pretty good at, at growing those trees without um, getting them root bound. That's what a root bound tree looks like. You never want to plant a tree like that because the roots go round and round. And after you plant it, they will keep going around and around and they'll strangle the tree and it'll have a very short lifespan. lifespan. But these guys are grown in, they're called air pots uh, and they're not root bound, but it's a very small root biomass, amount of roots compared to the size of the tree that they have to support. So once you plant these trees, the first thing they have to do is rebuild that root system. Uh, I ran into this, this uh, planting of oaks in a park in Newark, Delaware, a couple summers ago. I should have counted them. There were at least 10 there, but every single one was dead. So it was totally a failed planting um, and they spent a lot of money killing their oaks. Uh, we can do better than that. This is the other option, of course, the bald and burlap. A large tree where you simply chop off all the roots, wrap it up in burlap and plant it. Obviously very hard on trees. If you plant an acorn the same day you plant one of these trees, uh, the acorn after 10 years is going to be bigger and much healthier than these bald and burlap trees. Because these guys, just like the air pot trees, they've got to rebuild their root system. Uh, and that takes, that tends to take at least a, a decade. Um, so try it someday. Plant one of these and plant an acorn the same day and see which one is healthier after, after a decade. It means you have to wait a few years, but uh, delay that gratification and you will have a much healthier tree. Good size to plant an oak. Uh, I wish nurserymen would sell them at this size, but um, yeah, can't make as much money if you, if you do that. But of course, if you plant a small oak like that, then we do have to ask the question, do they grow too slowly? Um, we, they do have that, that uh, reputation of being very slow growers. Well, let's have a race 
This is the oak that we planted from an acorn in, in uh, my yard. Let's have a race between this white oak at six years old here and little Bella, who's only two years old. So she's got a lot of growing to go. Maybe she can grow faster than the white oak because we all know white oaks grow really, really slowly. So here it is at six years old, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Bella's losing. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 18, 19, 2020, Bella's got her mask on. And look, she has clearly lost the race between uh, herself and that white oak. And Bella's 5'11", too. So uh, she did the best she could. So I'm going to totally reject this, this myth. Oaks do not grow too slowly. They grow a little slowly in the beginning. But if you wait a few years, they'll grow as fast as any other landscape plant and be much healthier. Uh, and an important thing to consider is that oaks contribute ecologically to your landscape the very first year you plant them, even as acorns. This is a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves, uh, which means the pin oak is starting to support the biodiversity in your yard. It's starting to share its energy so that you have a viable food web. Then a bird comes along and eats this um, right away. You don't have to wait decades for that to happen. Are oaks too large to use in small landscapes? Uh, well, you're never going to find a, a landscape designer or a landscape architect to recommend a large oak for a, a front yard this size. But they used to do it. These are red oaks uh, that were planted probably when this house was built. Uh, and that probably was at least 100 years ago. Remember, 100 years ago, there was no air conditioning. So these oaks provided a, a very valuable ecosystem service to the people in this house. They lowered the temperature by 10 degrees. They have not lifted up the sidewalk. They have not fallen over and crushed the house. So you, it can happen. Here's a large oak in, in the front yard of a church a large church. So it's a very large oak. Fortunately, they did not cut it down when they built the church. This is a, an Oregon white oak, uh, Quercus gariana, in the yard of a very small house in Portland, Oregon. Um, so you can find these big trees in small yards. But again, nobody's going to recommend that. What I want to focus on here is that you have small options. In the east, we've got dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides. The Georgia oak is occasionally in, in the uh, in the trade, blackjack oak, um, bluejack oak. There's a dwarf version of Quercus virginianum, the, the great big spreading southern uh, live oak, um, Chapman oak. So these are all options in the east. The yellow highlighted ones are options in Texas alone. There are more small oaks in the west than there are in the east. What we have to do is get more of these into the trade so that people have the option of planting a small species. Dwarf chestnut oak is the most common one in, in the, uh, the trade. Quercus prinoides. Here's one in my yard. It made acorns when it was five feet tall. Another option would be to coppice your, your oaks. Now, I don't know of anybody who's actually doing this. I found this picture on, on the web. But what you do is you let your, your tree get to be two or three inches in diameter, cut it off at the base, and it will come back as a bush. Uh, you can do that for 100 years. Just keep cutting the leader off, and it'll come back as a bush. You get um, valuable oak foliage supported by a large root system. If you let it get 10, 15 feet tall, it'll make acorns, uh, even though it's not a giant tree, because it's got that mature root system. Um, so if you want a large oak species in a small version, try coppicing in your yard. Will oaks crush our houses if we plant them in our yards? Well, again, they can. And of course, if they do, you'll hear about it on the news because the news only reports uh, bad things. You will never hear about the oak that does not fall over on your house. And it's not just oaks. All of our large trees are falling over um, under the right conditions. And we plant them over conditions that favor them to blow down. We isolate them. We want them to be big specimen trees so they don't compete for uh, light or, or uh, moisture or nutrients with any other tree. So we separate them, which means they cannot interlock their root systems with other trees. And then we get a lot of rain and wind and boom, over they go. This is the way trees grow in a forest. Their roots are, are uh, interlocked in a matrix, which is extremely stable, very tough to blow these trees over. This is what, uh, uh, it's a stream cut near my house. It's washed all the soil away from one, two, three, four trees. And you can see how interlocked their roots are. Again, extremely tough to blow these guys over. A tornado will snap them off, 
but we don't have any landscaping tricks to protect us against tornadoes. But uh, the, the average storm is not going to blow it over on your house. So instead of this, consider this. These are the two white oaks that we actually got our original acorns from about a mile and a half down the street. Nobody planted them. They planted themselves about three feet apart. A road was put in afterwards. Uh, now, neither one is as spectacular as it would be if they had been planted um, alone, but we're going to view them as a grove of tree. Tree groves, uh, it's a new aesthetic, but they will be much more stable in our landscapes. Uh, these are the three sisters in Northwest Connecticut, three red oaks that are growing right next to each other. You can find this fairly often in nature. This is a planned landscape. This is at Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. Uh, it's a DuPont estate dedicated to native plants. Big red oak in the background here, hemlocks in the foreground, large roadies down, down on the ground with hardscape. It was planned, but it looks totally natural. All of these trees are interlocking their roots. It's providing wonderful habitat uh, for lots of creatures. If you have two or three acres of lawn and you're wondering how to reduce that area, this is a great option to do it. And it's aesthetically pleasing. Is your oak going to lift up your hardscape, your sidewalk or your driveway? Well, here's a pin oak, which is not lifting up this road, no problem at all. It depends on what is underneath the oak when you plant it. Um, these are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware. That's a big tree right next to the curve, no problem at all. If you plant your oak over bedrock, the roots will go laterally and it will lift up your, your hardscape. If you plant it over agricultural pan, so if you know your house was, was built on an old ag field that had been plowed for 200 years where the plowed went down maybe at 12, 15 inches every single year, the soil beneath that plow got very compacted into what is called pan and the roots will go down and hit that pan and then go laterally. So if you know you have pan, break it up with a pickaxe before you plant a tree or get a ripper on a tractor and, and break up all that pan, then your trees will not lift up your hardscape. Okay, March, that is when uh, those marcescent leaves finally do start to drop to the ground. So let's talk about what oak leaves do once they leave the tree. First, there's a lot of variability in oak leaf shape. A lot of people think all oak, leaf, oak leaves have lobes. Uh, many of them do, some are pointed, some are not pointed, but not all. This is a live oak uh, leaf. This is a willow oak leaf. This is an emery oak. It looks like a holly leaf, a water oak, a shingle oak. Um, so lobes are not a feature of all oak trees, but there is tremendous variability in oak leaf shape. And there are a lot of leaves on an oak tree, up to 700,000. And if they were all to be lined up next to each other on a tennis course, it would cover four tennis courts. And that is their job, to cover the ground. Remember I said a single oak leaf will take up to three years to break down. That's much longer than it takes a, a, a maple leaf or a birch leaf or a, a tulip tree leaf. They don't even make it through a single summer, which means you end up with bare soil. And bare soil is very hard on the soil community. The soil dries out. All of the little critters that are in the soil that are decomposing these leaves uh, have to leave, have to go deep. The mycorrhizal associations break down because the soil's dry. You get wind erosion, you get, you get water erosion. Bare soil is an ecological no-no. So the, the oak leaves are protecting the soil. Uh, and and uh, remember, there are more species underneath the, the soil than above the soil. So that it deserves protecting, very valuable resource on your property. People worry about whether their plants can get through their uh, oak leaves or not if you don't rake them away. Of course, if you have five feet of oak leaves in a flower bed, nothing's gonna get through that. But if you have a normal layer of oak leaves, your plants do. Uh, get through. This is a, a fern. It's not a planting. It was just a natural occurrence. I stopped and took its picture next to a big white oak. No problem getting through that. These are uh, wood poppies at my house uh, popping right through the leaves. I didn't rake any of the leaves. Uh, native Pachysandra, Virginia creeper, um, lot, no problem getting, getting through these, these leaves for many of our ground covers. If you look at a single square meter of oak leaf litter, there are a lot of things living in there. 250,000 mites, 100,000 springtails, little columbulins like the spinthurid, 90,000 proturans, primitive insects. You almost need a microscope to see them. A million nematodes. That's a lot of life that is in your leaf litter. And most of those things are detritivores. They are breaking down the leaves so that the nutrients that are in those leaves can be taken up by the tree the following year. 
if we rake our leaves away and throw them away, we've thrown away all those nutrients. We've thrown away all these creatures. We've thrown away uh, the banded hair streak. That beautiful butterfly's caterpillar develops on uh, on dead oak leaves. We've thrown away 70 species of litter moths, things like the ambiguous litter moth or the American idea or the dark spotted palthus. Uh, their larvae are eating dead leaves as well. When you see birds like uh, some of our sparrows, white-throated sparrow or the towhees, other birds doing this little hopping dance in your, your leaf litter, what they're doing is pushing the leaves back, looking for the caterpillars of, of these guys. That's what gets them through the winter. And you throw all that away when you throw your leaves away. Um, you're also throwing away where your predators live. There's, there's predators in there controlling all of those things and number of species of ground beetles. It's where your lightning bugs live, your fireflies. These guys are not bugs or flies, uh, they're beetles. This is what a, a, a firefly beetle, a lampyrid beetle looks like. It's got its, its uh, lantern back here and the adults talk to each other. Uh, to uh, attract males and females with that light. But this is what the larva looks like. Looks like a little prehistoric creature. It is a predator in leaf litter. When you throw away your leaf litter, your lightning bugs disappear. I hear that, you know, that question all the time. What happened to my lightning bugs? Um, you, they, they require that high humidity leaf litter in order to exist. Okay, April is when the, the buds first start to break out uh, in your, your oak tree. And it's the time where you get to see one of the most ephemeral interactions that occurs in all of nature. It only lasts about five minutes a year. Uh, it it's, happens frequently, but only for five minutes. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of oak trees. So here's a female cynipid. There's her ovipositor. She's going to inject an egg into this, this bud. This is a male that is riding her. He's, he's already mated with her, so the egg has been fathered by, by this guy. Uh, but he's still riding her because after she lays this egg, she's going to go to another bud and lay another egg, and he wants to be the father of that egg as well. This is a male who wishes he was that male. So here she is. She's injecting an egg into this, this bud. Um, buds are meristematic cells. They're stem cells. They can grow in any, any size or shape. Uh, but their growth is regulated by plant hormones. So this cynipid is not only injecting an egg, she's injecting plant hormones to direct this, the growth of this cell. But the oak has plant hormones as well. So the gall that results is a compromise between what the galler wants and what the, the, uh, the oak wants after it's attacked. And it turns out to be a species-specific shape. So you can tell exactly what species of cynipid is in your, uh, your, on your oak just by the shape of the gall. There are a lot of species of gallers that are associated with oaks, uh, a thousand, at least a thousand worldwide. A single oak tree can support up to 70 species of gallers. And many of those galls are hollow. It's very curious. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. I've seen it written both ways. And if you cut it in half, there's a spear in the center of that gall. Uh, and that's where the galler is. It's right in the middle there. Then you've got this big air space here and the outside of the gall. So why is the gall morphology like that? Well, it turns out that, that cynipid gallers have more natural enemies, more species of parasitoids, other wasps that attack them, that lay their eggs in the cynipid galler and, and kill them. And, and then it turns into, this is a pterimid wasp, female. Very long ovipositor. So uh, the distance from the outside of the gall to the center of the gall where the galler is has to be bigger than the length of this ovipositor. Otherwise, these parasitoids can reach the cynipid and, and kill it. Now, in the beginning, the galls are small, and that is an option uh, for those, those parasitoids. They can get in there at the very beginning, but the galls grow very, very quickly and uh, isolate that galler in the center of the gall, protect it with that big space. This is a pterimid in the west that has the longest ovipositor, and that has resulted in the largest gall we have in the country, uh, which is an effort to get the galler away from the, the reach of that very long ovipositor. Tremendous variation in gall size and shape. Uh, and some of them are quite pretty. Many of them are spherical, they grow on leaves. Others are spherical and grow on stems. Some of them look like candy. Some of them look like that. 
Many of them look like diseases. Um, some look like spindles, some look like more, more candy. These, these real pretty ones are in California. I've got to get out there and take their picture. This is a one that looks like pottery that's at, at uh, my house. I call this the uh, little gnome house gall. This is after the galler has emerged. Looks like a door, but it's just emerged. The brain gall. This is an interesting one. You've got four galls on a single leaf. Uh, and uh, the galler, when it created the gall, laid a number of eggs in the gall. So each one of these holes is where an adult galler emerged. So uh, the single leaf produced hundreds of adult cynipid gall wasps. And it turns out that galls have played a very important role in the recorded history of, of uh, humans. If you grind up a gall and combine it with com certain chemicals, it creates an indelible black ink. It's the tannins in the galls that do that. And that is the ink that our recorded history was recorded with. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. All of the writings of, of uh, the, the monks and scribes in the Middle Ages and Leonardo da Vinci, all with gall ink. Interesting factoid at your next cocktail party. Okay, May is when those leaves really start to expand uh, and the biological year takes off. And of course, following the expansion of uh, leaves all over the temperate zone comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves come the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is no coincidence that migration uh, is tightly linked with the expansion of leaves in the temperate zone and the caterpillars that eat those leaves because the caterpillars are what those migrants need to complete their migration. Remember, in the spring, uh, the, the plants have not made any berries or seeds yet. So it's insects that, that fuel the migration and most of those insects turn out to be caterpillars. Birders know that and because they have discovered a long time ago that warblers in particular love oaks. If you wanna see a warbler during migration, you go to an oak and it's kind of like a Christmas tree, they're decorating it. I had a, a student, Christy Beal, several years ago, measured the amount of time that warblers were foraging in different families of, of trees in cemeteries, large trees in cemeteries. This is the Phagaceae. Uh, that is the family in, that contains the oaks, the chestnuts, and the beeches, but there were no chestnuts and beeches in her study sample. It was all oaks, and look, that's where the birds are spending their time. Some time in pines, a little bit in, in uh, birches, but uh, the oaks went out for sure. And that's because, again, that's where those caterpillars are. Things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher. The lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn uh, caterpillar. This is called the crown slug. Uh, it's not a slug, but they're called slug because their head is tucked up underneath. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and the spun glass slug caterpillar, which I think is the prettiest caterpillar in the country, certainly the most intricate. And hundreds more species are associated with oaks, and that's what fuels those migrations. Now, this is what our house looks like uh, today. We put many of the plants back, still working on it. Uh, and along with those plants um, came the caterpillars that drive the food web on our property. So five years ago, I decided to try to take a picture of every species of caterpillar that's making a, a living at our house. Uh, and I'm up to 1,195 species of moths, just moths so far. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Point I wanna make tonight though, is that 28% of them use oaks. Now oaks are only 1.5% of the diversity of plants on our property. So those moths really are, are uh, going to our, our oaks. And because so many of those species of moths are bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, largely because we have put the oaks there. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take the stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, keystone species, keystone plants, um, I call them keystone plants because if we take them out of our local food webs, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives 
are food webs. And oaks are the best keystone plant because they're supporting uh, at least 950 caterpillar species. It's actually 952 so far, but we keep finding new ones nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that in terms of supporting those all important caterpillars. Why are caterpillars all important? Why do we need so many caterpillars in our food webs? Because they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't produce enough caterpillars, um, you're going to have a failed food web and then a failed ecosystem. And of course, if we have failed ecosystems, they're not supporting um, we, we humans, us humans, we humans. Um, and again, oaks are making the most caterpillars. And don't forget, it's not just the migrants that need those caterpillars. The breeding birds need them as well. Things like chickadees that don't migrate, they're eating seeds in the wintertime, but, but their babies can't eat seeds, so they switch to caterpillars when they're reproducing. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of chickadees. To, make one, to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, and after they leave the nest, they continue to eat caterpillars for another 21 days. Their parents are feeding them. And of course, after they're independent, they continue to eat caterpillars. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. And that's why we need those oaks, because they're making the most caterpillars. Okay, June, that's cicada month. I don't think, I don't think uh, that Connecticut had an emergence of the periodical cicada last summer, but we sure did. So let's just go over it quickly. Uh, it's a wonderful biological phenomenon. We got the 17-year periodical cicada and the 13-year periodical cicada. It was the 17-year brood that came out at, at uh, my house last June. And of course, we knew it was going to happen. The media knew it was going to happen. And the media loved to vilify nature. They loved to, to uh, try to scare you um, into thinking that it's too scary to go outside. So they called it a terrible scourge that's coming. We should all fear it. You might consider moving so you don't have to endure it. The cicadas are going to sing so loud that, that mothers will go crazy and kill their babies. It's an invasion. I heard all the things. I really did. Uh, of course, it was none of those things. It's one of the most fantastic biological events you'll ever have the privilege to, to witness. It was big. There were a lot of cicadas uh, this time around. These are the shed skins after they emerge from the ground where they have been feeding on plant roots, largely oaks, for the last 17 years. When they come out of the ground, uh, they leave a hole. That's, that's aerating your soil. You don't have to pay anybody to do it. It allows oxygen and water down to those roots and really helps the growth of your trees. Um, as I said, there were a lot so many that, what was that, 11 Mississippi kites flew up to Newark, Delaware to eat our cicadas. I don't know where they came from, but uh, more people came to see the Mississippi kites than, than the cicadas. <clears throat> so here's the average life cycle. They crawl out at night and hang upside down, then split their, their skin. This is called an exuvii. Uh, and the, the tenoral adult hill will swing up and, and hang on to that shed skin. It's like a soft shell crab now, extremely vulnerable. Anything can eat it. And that's why they do this at night, so that nothing can see them. They'll hang there for uh, several hours until they tan. They harden up their, their skeleton, their exoskeleton. And once it's hard, they can fly away and start their life cycle. And by that, I mean they're going to, if it's a male, he's going to sing and try to attract a female. And the louder he sings, the bigger, the better the chance of him attracting a female. By singing, what they do is they vibrate two membranes in their thorax. That's the thorax right there. Uh, it's like a clicking Coke can. If you have a Coke can, you click it. It goes click, 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 click. Well, they do that about 400 times a second, and it creates a buzz. And it can be pretty loud, because remember, he wants to find a mate. This guy was loud enough to find a mate. She came, mated with him, and now it's her turn. She's going to lay her eggs in the stems of uh, trees, but largely oak trees. So this is a uh, pin oak in my front yard, and she's jamming her ovipositor into this twig. That's hard to do. I invite you to get a pin and try to stick it into an oak branch and see if you don't bend the pin. Uh, well, somehow they managed to do it. Here she is. She's jammed it all the way in there. She's going to lay an egg and she's going to move down four, seven, six, eight eggs in a row there. Then she'll go to a different branch and do it all over again. From the point where she lays her eggs on out distally, uh, the branch often dies. That's called flagging. People get upset. The cicadas are going to kill my, my trees. They're not going to kill your trees. Um, 
they're going to prune them a little bit once every 17 years and your your trees will will like it look the cicadas do not choose every tree this is a uh i don't know what it is might be i think it's a non-native uh, but they totally avoided it they loved the oak here i did have a student compare flagging on the different tree species that were in Newark, Delaware, and these green bars are different types of oaks, so they did certainly uh, favor the oaks when they were laying their eggs. And then they die. Takes about three weeks for the adult's uh, lifespan. Um, goes by in a flash. So you might wonder why they spend 17 years underground, and the leading hypothesis again is predator satiation. Uh, there are a lot of things that like to eat cicadas, but if there is no a uh, cicada eater that can gear its life cycle uh, to only be around once every 17 years. So uh, in that sense, when they come out uh, en masse every 17 years, they can easily overwhelm the number of squirrels or birds that are there to eat them. July is uh, when the night chorus begins. And by night chorus, I'm talking about katydids. This is a male katydid. He will lift up his wings and rub these two parts back and forth against each other. It's a scraper and a file on the sclerotized section of the wing and creates a species-specific sound that many of us are very familiar with. Why do they sing? Well, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. I did a lot of camping in North Jersey when I was growing up with that. Those Katie did sang me to sleep lots of nights. It's a wonderful sound. Uh, there are four species of Katie dids that frequent oak forests. Um, largely in the east. There's only one species uh, in, in the west. This is what a female looks like just before she emerges. She hasn't expanded her wings yet, but her ovipositor is ready to go. And here she is. Her wings are, are fully expanded. She's now going to go in search of a male, and they are so loud because she's going to look for the loudest male. There's a lot of, of selection. Females like loud males because it is a measure of male health, of male quality. They want to find a male with the best genes. After they mate, they will lay their eggs. They glue their eggs to a stick like this. Um, they're very large eggs. These guys have already hatched, but people find them and wonder what they are. They are Katie did eggs. Now, Katie did start singing about mid July. They'll sing through July, through August, into September. Depends on when it starts to get cold. Uh, at my house now, we're in October, but they've stopped singing because we're having a cold, cold snap. Uh, not very many left. Speaking of August, uh, this is the time when it's really tough. Uh, if you are a, an oak leaf eater, because oak leaves have gotten really tough. In the spring, of course, they're soft and viable and pliable and, and uh, easy to eat, very nutritious. Lots of things want them in the spring. But by August, uh, they are tough as boards. They are loaded with lignans and tannins. Um, so you need special adaptations to eat oak leaves in, in August. And the caterpillars that do that um, typically use two strategies. One is to be gregarious, where they all feed together. This is the yellow neck caterpillar. <clears throat> you get an entire clutch working together because apparently it's easier to get through this tough material with lots of mouths than just, um, just one or two. Here they are in their last instar. They're almost fully grown and still eating together because uh, it does make it easier. It's a common strategy. This is the uh, orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. So lots of, of different species are using this gregarious strategy and they can eat a fair amount of material. This is the tree we're following in 2014. I walked around it and counted the number of caterpillars just on the lower branch, the lower branches. I didn't climb ladders or anything. And I found 410 caterpillars. And then I stood back and took this picture so that I could ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? Don't, don't kid me now. I know you don't see any. How much of the caterpillar damage do you see? You don't see any of that either. And this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 410 caterpillars in your oak tree, most people would get upset. Ah, call the man, get the spray can, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks are really good at sharing the energy they've captured from the sun. And because they do, we have other living things in our yard. I met a woman in, in uh, New Orleans several years ago, Tammany Baumgarten, who suggested we all 
uh, practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. And I think that is excellent advice. The second strategy for eating tough leaves is to become a leaf miner. You only eat the center of the leaf. The toughness is on the outside here, but the, the palisade mesophylls, the parenchymal cells are, are soft and tender and that's where the nutrition is. In other words, you become a leaf miner. So again, these are caterpillars that are doing it, uh, but they have to be really small and thin caterpillars. The egg was laid here. The little guy starts eating and he tunnels. This is called a serpentine mine because it looks like a snake. The black line in the middle here are its frass, its, its poops. It pushes them all to the center. Then he pupates here. And that's the total amount of leaf material that it will eat. This is a blotched leaf mine. There's the caterpillar there. He just goes in a circle, makes it a little bit bigger each time. There it is backlit. And here it is with a very nice uh, picture by Salvador Vitenza. Uh, now, they don't look much like caterpillars when they're leaf miners because they need all those specialized adaptations. But when they come out as adults, they do look like uh, moths. Um, they're tiny, but they look just like moths. This is one of the Camomaria species specialized on oaks, the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, many species of leaf miners on oaks. Okay, September, our final month, uh, is when you first start to notice crickets, typically the black crickets on the ground. You know, if a cricket gets in your house and sings, it's good luck. But there are also crickets up on our trees. They're called tree and bush crickets. They're not black. They're usually yellowish or tan, um, sometimes greenish. But they're doing the same thing. The males are singing to try to attract females. Uh, now, these males know that the loudest male is going to get the female. But they're, they're very smart about it. They find a hole in a leaf, or they actually chew a hole in a leaf that is the right size, and they stick their head through it lift up their wings and move them back and forth and make their, their singing sound. Now, most leaves are, have a slight parabolic shape to them and it projects the sound farther and louder than if he was singing on a flat surface. So in essence, he is sending a false message to the female. He's saying, I'm a big male, when in fact, he's not all that big. And the female comes and mate with them and, and he's very proud of himself. Uh, so you might think, can you believe the male is sending the, a female a false message? But it might not be that false a message because the, the, uh, he might not be the biggest, loudest male, but he might be the smartest male, and that might be good enough for the female. September is also a best time to find walking sticks. They're usually up in the canopy all, all summer long. We don't see them, but they start to come down when it gets cool. Um, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. That's a male. This is on an embry oak in, in Arizona. Uh, but they have a, a, a curious reproductive behavior. They'll walk around, the females will walk around the canopy and just drop eggs to the forest floor. Some of those eggs hatch the first year, some hatch the second year, and a few even hang on to a third year. That's called bet hedging. In case the conditions aren't right on any given year, she won't put all of her eggs into that year. Some will, will hatch another year. So those eggs are laying on the ground now. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, this is a, a blood robe which of course is one of the spring ephemerals and they make these little pods and their seeds are in those pods. And when the pod breaks open, the seed is pretty little uh, reddish orange thing. And it's got this white structure on it. It's called an eliasome. Eliasomes are really tasty to ants. So ants come, they pick up the seed, they wanna eat the eliasome, uh, but they're all for the colony. So they take the, the seed back to the colony. They all eat the eliasome. Nobody can eat the seed, it's too hard. So they throw it into their garbage dump which is a perfect place for this bloodroot seed to germinate. Well, these are working stick eggs. And look, they've got this white stripe, just, just like uh, the eliasome. Um, for some reason, they fool the ants. So the, the, uh, the, I bet it smells just like an eliasome. They pick up the walking stick egg, they put it, take it back to the nest, find they can't eat it, and they throw it in the garbage dump, a perfect place, very safe place for these young walking sticks to hatch out of. All right, we've gone through the year. We've talked about just some of the things that are happening on the oaks right in your yards if you go out and, and look for them. So let's end talking about the, the problem that we, we opened up with, and that is not just the insect decline problem, but the biodiversity crisis in general. I mean, you've heard we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Our, our insects are disappearing. You know, nothing's disappearing. We're, we're killing them. There's no mystery about this. We're killing our birds. We're killing our insects. We're killing the nature that supports us. 
And we are now in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced. So it is a global crisis, but it does have a grassroots solution, one that you and I can address and actually make a difference. And that is good news. There are four things that every landscape must do today if we're going to reach a sustainable relationship with the planet that supports us. All of our landscapes have to have enough plants to capture carbon and pull it out of the atmosphere. That's our contribution to climate change. Uh, all landscapes have to manage the watershed. Every single landscape is in a watershed. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy that watershed by taking away the plants and replacing them with, with either uh, impermeable surface or lawn, which is close to it. All landscape has to, has to support diverse community of pollinators, not because they're pollinating our crops, but because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. You know, I hear people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. And finally, all landscapes have to support a complex food web. In other words, share the energy they're capturing from the sun with animals so that we have animals and plants to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. When you plant an oak, <clears throat> you're addressing all four of those vital ecological roles. You're planting a tree that is going to capture more carbon over its lifespan than any other tree. It's gonna manage the watershed better because it has a bigger uh, root mass. It's gonna support a more complex food web than any other tree because it's supporting more species of, of animals. It even supports a, a, a diverse community of pollinators, even though it's wind pollinated. So this is, this is new, we're just learning about this. Here are the oak catkins on a pin oak outside my upstairs window, and here comes a bee to get the pollen on those, those uh, catkins. Um, I, I watched this, it wasn't long, five, 10 minutes, and there were something like three species of native bees and a honeybee came to get the pollen off these, these catkins. So even though these guys are not actually pollinating, they're not moving the pollen to the female flower, they're using the pollen. It's a contribution that our oaks are making to our pollinators. Well, despite all those wonderful landscape attributes, our oaks are in trouble. We've lost the old giants. We cut them down long ago. Most of them, there are a few left, but um, because they were in the way of our farms uh, and, and uh, they also provided an awful lot of wood. The percentage of oaks in our Eastern forest has been cut in half. Uh, in the last hundred years uh, because we've suppressed fire, which favors oaks. Uh, we've introduced a number of diseases and, and pests. Uh, we've got, you know, everybody knows the gypsy moth, which is now the spongy moth, by the way, clobbering our oaks. Then we have oak wilt. We've got oak uh, leaf scorch. We've got sudden oak death syndrome, a lot of things affecting our oaks negatively. We've got deer overabundance which is preventing the regeneration of oaks in our forest. Every, every young oak that pops up, the deer eat it before it can become a tree. Uh, so there's no recruitment in our forests anymore. And we've got habitat fragmentation that is separating our oaks uh, so much that their pollen can't reach each other and egg pollen production can be reduced. You put all those things together, you get 28 of our 91 North American oak species threatened. One third of our global oak species are now endangered. The Oregon white oak has lost 97% of its uh, range. It used to go from the middle of California all the way up through uh, Washington state because its favorite habitat is what now is in, in agriculture. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And we humans live our lives out in a very brief instant of ecological time. And we can't return those giant oaks to our forest during that time period, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, your oak will achieve a, a size where it actually does start to perform its keystone roles in your, your ecosystem. We are all responsible for good earth stewardship. I say that because we all need good earth stewardship. We all depend on the quality of local ecosystems. So we all have the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems. And there's no better way to take care of your local ecosystem than to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our lightning bugs, our galls, our weevils, our orthopterans, our lepidopterans, our caterpillars, us for our own sake, Plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. And if you decide to plant the future, 
please join Homegrown National Park. This is our, our uh, small nonprofit we've started, um, just two years old at this point. Go to homegrownnationalpark.org and register your property on the map. And all that means is, it's free by the way, all that means is that you're going to uh, put down where you live and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of, that you're going to take care of it. We are asking people to reduce the area in lawn because lawn doesn't accomplish any of those things we talked about, to plant more natives where there used to be lawn, to remove the invasives that almost everybody has on their property in some form or another, to protect any natural areas that you may have on your property. Our product, Homegrown National Product, is national awareness, not just of the problem, but of the solutions to this biodiversity crisis. We need to change our culture. We need to recognize that nature is not optional and that everybody has a responsibility to sustaining it. Uh, the map will also provide measurable conservation progress. The benefits of Homegrown National Park are to convert hope into action. We need action at this point. We've talked long enough. We need some action. It's aspirational. It doesn't rely on any governmental support. We'll accept governmental support, but um, this is a grassroots solution here. It's going to reveal holes in our biological carter so we can focus on, on education there and connect those wild places. And it merges national conservation efforts that already exist, things like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones. There's many of them. All those people can get on the map without competing with their original organization because we're just there to educate, not to provide the services. So please consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that incredible talk. I learned so much. Um, I'm gonna be unstoppable at the next dinner party I go to. Um, <laughs> Forget to tell about gold. Ink. <laughs> it's, it's going to be my opening line. Okay. Um, we got some really terrific questions in the Q&A box, and I'd, I'd like to field them over to you. So the first question um, is from James, and he's saying, in Sherman, we are losing ash to the emerald ash borer. Entire stands of ash trees fall and leave these canopy openings. He wants to know, should we plant white oak acorns and protect the emerging saplings or allow birds slash mammals to broadcast whatever seeds via their droppings? Um, he also adds that their property has magnificent tulips, beech, and pig nut slash shagbark hickory. Okay, we, we need to do all of that. Oh, we do. Yes, you want the animals to disperse the, the oak seeds the, the way they normally would. But yes, you should also plant oaks. We don't, you know, really, we have far fewer than used to be in our forests, and it needs our help, particularly in our managed landscapes. Um, so, and that takes our, our intervention, uh, which means there's going to be areas in your lawn where there's going to be an oak. You've got to stop mowing it or you mow the little guy down. The, the, the blue jay doesn't know that. It'll plant it where it's, it's vulnerable. Um, yes, you're losing your ashes, but don't give up on ashes. We actually have some good news coming out of research for biological control of the emerald ash borer. Um, several uh, Chinese parasitoids that uh, in, in some places, there have been some counties in New Jersey where there's gotten 80% control. So we're hoping to get this under control before all the ashes are gone. Uh, and of course, we're trying to favor the ashes that have a little bit of genetic resistance to this, this borer. That's fantastic. Um, this this question is part of is more about monarch caterpillars, but the question is: Will birds eat monarch caterpillars even though they contain cardioglycosides? Um, the standard answer is no, uh, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, when the caterpillar contains cardiac glycosides, yes, they are very distasteful and the birds won't eat them. But not all milkweed patches have a lot of cardiac glycosides. So there actually are monarch populations that are not that distasteful. And this is where the monarch coloration comes in. It's aposematic coloration, it's orange and black, and it's a general warning signal to the birds that we taste bad, even if some of them don't. Uh, so, uh, the, so most birds are going to avoid monarchs. They might try one or two here and there. The viceroy uh, butterfly is mimicking monarchs. We used to think that was Batesian mimicry because the viceroy tasted good. It actually tastes bad too. 
So it's Mullerian mimicry where they're all using the same uh, warning coloration. There are invertebrates, there are spiders that eat lots of monarchs. Uh, monarch eggs, 90% of them are eaten by ants before they even hatch. So there are things that eat monarchs, but typically not birds. I did not know that about ants eating the eggs. That's very interesting. Um, the picture you showed of the oak that gets cut every couple of years to come back as a bush. We had a couple questions about that. It is a beautiful landscaping feature. Um, what's the name of that particular oak? Can you do that with any oak? Yes, you can do it with any oak. I, you know, again, I found that picture on the web. Um, I think it's a, a red oak. It could have been a scarlet, I'm not sure. Uh, it, not just any oak, you can do it with cherries, you can do it with lots of trees. Coppicing used to be a standard way of treating many of our forest trees uh, back in the, the days of the settlers. I'm not sure what they used all that coppice for, but they, they made <laughs> baskets out of it. I don't know. Uh, it, they could. <laughs> it was pretty standard. Um, so, so try it. Uh, cut them off when they're, you know, two, three, four inches in diameter, and it will come back as a bush. Now, conifers won't do that. So we're talking about deciduous trees, um, and oaks are very good at it. Fantastic. Um, here's a question about oak leaves and composting. Should you avoid putting oak leaves into your compost pile because of their ability to, you know, survive for three years? No. Oak leaves make great compost. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, no, I never, I never heard that before. You don't want your compost to disappear. Compost is organic matter, and it is slowly um, volatilizing and releasing the carbon into the air. So the longer your compost lasts, the more you can use it as compost. Uh, so yes, you spread it on, on the ground, and it will release the nutrients that are being broken down. But um, oaks will help your compost last longer. Maintain the moisture in your compost pile. You don't want it to dry out because that's the end of the decomposition, but no, oaks make wonderful compost. Related question about oak leaf management is, are we still getting the benefit of leaf litter if we rake up the leaves and move them to garden beds or again, compost heaps? Okay, that's a good question. Um, you, you, you want the leaves essentially under the trees that made them so that the nutrients can return to the soil there. Uh, but, now, I talk about reducing the area in lawn. I don't talk about getting rid of lawn. So the lawn we keep, it's still a great place to walk, and it's a cue for care. It shows that we understand what the culture is. We're not just going to let our places go wild and messy. We're going to manicure the lawn that we keep, which means you have to rake the leaves off of those areas. And yes, put them under your trees in, in beds. Uh, you have to be a little mindful that you don't make it too, too deep. But so here's an example. My son bought a house couple years ago, a new house. And the first fall, he called me up and he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with my leaves? And I said, rake them in your flower beds. And he said, I don't have enough flower beds. And I said, exactly. That's how you create a flower yeah. bed. You, that's where you want to mound your leaves, put them under your, your, your tree where you're going to have a new flower bed. It's how you reduce the area of lawn and then plant right through those leaves uh, the next spring. Because um, because thick leaf litter is a great way to to smother the lawn that you're trying to get rid of. So that's fant that's fantastic advice. Just to use the leaves and then go in on top. That's fantastic. Um, other questions include how widespread has sudden oak death disease become in the Northeast, and is it getting worse? Can we do anything to control it? Sudden Oak Death Syndrome actually came into the West Coast. It, it was transported to the East um, with nursery stock, I think to North Carolina. <clears throat> they uh, worked very hard to get every one of those plants that were brought in. Uh, and maybe they did. I think there's been a couple of mishaps where it's been brought in. So in the East, it's, it is not a big problem. The big problem in the East is bacterial leaf scorch and oak wilt. Oak wilt is more of a uh, mid-country issue, uh, like uh, Ohio, for example, and Indiana. Uh, what I have at my house is bacterial leaf scorch. It's very hard on the red oak group, so it, it kills um, pin oaks and red oaks and black oaks. 
Uh, but there is resistance out there. So I have lost uh, two black oaks and a red oak so far. I got a, a pin oak that's sick, but I've got several that are fine. Uh, and those are going to be the trees, the genotypes that spread in the future. So I hear, I hear uh, um, arborists and, and uh, foresters say, well, let's not plant any more oaks because they get sick. Don't do that and plant more oaks than ever because we cannot afford to lose the ecological value of these trees. We have to keep planting them. And if 90% of them die, I don't care. We'll get the 10% that don't, and that'll be the future of our forests. So this is this is your job, everybody. Run out and plant those, those acorns. Related to the future of our forests, um, we've had a question about uh, the relationship between forest fires and risk to oak trees. Um, okay, the uh, Native Americans who have been around in North America a lot longer than people thought managed forests with fire for centuries, for thousands of years, actually. Um, but when you do it properly, they are, are uh, essentially cool ground fires that do not reach the canopy and do not kill the trees. That favors oak forests because cherries and maples and tulips don't like that. Uh, so when you have uh, fairly regular ground fires, you can really push the survivorship of your, your uh, saplings towards oaks. When you suppress fires, then the, the tulip trees and the cherries and the, and the maples uh, really do quite, quite well. And it starts to uh, phase out the oaks. We also have selective logging where we selectively take out the oaks and, and leave everything else. And that's shifted the tree composition uh, against oaks as well. Uh, you know, nothing wants a crown fire, so it has to be managed uh, correctly, but oaks in general are forest adapted species, fire adapted species. That's great. Um, to our audience, if you have any additional questions, now is the time. Um, while you think of a good question, I'm just gonna share some closing housekeeping notes, which are that uh, I will send an email to all of you that will contain a link of this incredible presentation and also links to uh, Homegrown National Park and the four organizations that partner together to uh, create this event so you can learn more if you are so inclined. Um, I see no additional questions. So I want to first and foremost say thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. um, this was truly um, a pleasure. And again, I want to thank the Sherman Conservation Commission, Connecticut Audubon uh, Deer Pond Farm, and the Sherman Library for you know coming together and spreading the word about this. Um, so. Thank you. Oh, also, we've gotten some just some really positive comments that I will now share with you. Um, we've had a bravo from the audience. And also, Laura says, thank you. You're a tremendous inspiration. So thank well, you. Very much. Nice night, everybody. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. Have a wonderful night, everyone. And thank you. <laughs>